Hi guys, just before we start, um, can I make sure that everyone can hear me? Anyone in the comment section? So is the audio good? Everyone can hear me perfectly. All right, brilliant. Okay, let's start. Uh, so I hope everyone's doing well in quarantine. Uh, we are going to do cardiac electrophysiology today. And yeah, let's begin. All right, so this is generally how you want to approach uh, each physiology question. So I break it down into definitions, composition, appearance types, functions, examples, stimuli and regulations. And generally, whenever you see laws, equations, graphs, or values, uh, that's something that definitely needs to be memorized. And I think uh, the way, and by the way, when I mean approach a physiology question, I mean an oral question. So yeah, this is how you break it down. And I think the structure of how an oral question, how you approach it is uh, very important to the grade. And we're going to cover these nine questions today. Uh, they're all in part B. Uh, most of them related to cardiac electrophysiology and a few odd ones out. So I think that relates. So let's start with question 12, conduction system of the heart. So a few important definitions. Oh, and as you can see here, I've highlighted uh, what each part is. So definitions will be in yellow, compositions, orange, stuff like that. Cool. So automaticity. Uh, is the ability to spontaneously generate an electric impulse. And this is very unique to the pacemaker cells of the heart. And it's also common with pacemaker cells in the GIT. And I think they're called Kyle cells, uh, Kajal cells, however you want to pronounce it. And this is, uh, this is a, ex like the intrinsic ability to generate a, uh, an electrical impulse. And then you also have excitability, which is the ability to respond to an electrical impulse. Not to be confused with contractility, which is the ability to contract in response to an electric impulse. And then we have conductivity, the ability to transmit an electric impulse to another cardiac cell. Rhythmicity, uh, ability to send an electric impulse in a regular and even maze panner, manner. And uh, the refractoriness, which can be split into absolute refractory period and relative refractory period. It's the inability to respond to another impulse. All right, generally you have two types of cardiac cells. So within the heart, you have cardiomyocytes of the working, cardi working myocardium, and they're specialized for contraction. So they're composed of actin, myosin, tropomyosin, and all these, uh, all these elements within a sarcomere that will help you, that will help the cell to contract. Whereas the other type of cardiac cell is the cardiomyocyte of the conduction system. And these do not compose of contractile uh, components so they don't have contractility they are specialized only for automatic excitation and conduction so these are the pacemaker cells these are the um, uh, sinoidal node atrioventricular node and we'll come on to it later all right so composition of a cardiomyocyte is the fact that the the specialized part about them is the intercalated discs with uh, gap junctions that allow the conduction to occur as a functional sensation so interconnected discs are composed of gap junctions and desmosomes, and we'll get into a picture of them later. So this is a nice picture of the conduction system of the heart, composed of the SA node, the internodal pathways, as you can see here, connecting the SA node to the atrioventricular node. And then there's also the Bachmann's bundle, 
that connects both the atria, so the left atrium and the right atrium, the left atrium. Uh, you have the AV node, bundle of Hiss, and the left and right Tawar's bundle branches, the left bundle branch here, and the right bundle branch here, and the pecunia fiber is going down from the base of the ventricle all the way to back to the apex. All right, so the SA node is the primary pacemaker located in the junction of the superior vena cava with the right atrium. And it sets the sin what's called the sinus rhythm. And the sinus, sinus rhythm is between 60 to 100 beats per minute. Uh, beats per minute. And uh, it's always set only by the sinoatrial node. And there's two types of cells within the site. So there's two types of SA nodal cells. And they're not all pacemakers. So first type is pacemaker P cells with the intrinsic automaticity. So to generate an action potential on its own and has uh, fewer gap junctions because it doesn't need to uh, conduct it as well as, as much as these do. So these are the transitional T cells with more gap junctions and myofibrils and direct the impulse to the atrial myocardium. So in an, uh, in an SA node, during each heartbeat, one pacemaker always depolarizes first and the action potential is sent to the surrounding P cells. It's not always the same, it's not always the same cell, but one cell, one pacemaker cell will eventually depolarize. And then the electric impulse travels to the left atrium via the Bachmann's bundle, as we mentioned previously. So the right atrium travels to the Bachmann's bundle, left atrium, and so allows both atria to contract at the same time. So yeah, both atria contract. Uh, and then the conduction from the uh, sinoatrial node travels to the atrioventricular node, and this occurs through atrial myocytes, but it's faster through the internodal tract, composed of the following anterior internodal tract of Bachmann, middle internodal tract of Wankenbach, and posterior internodal tract of Thoral. Uh, this is not to be confused with uh, the anterior internodal tract, it's not to be confused with the action, actual Bachmann's bundle, that's different. The Bachmann's bundle is here, from between the right and the left atrium, but the anterior internodal tract of Bachmann is different. It's different. All right, so next we have the AV node, located in the right posterior portion of the interatrial septum, and it's located immediately behind the tricuspid valve, tricuspid valve sitting right here. So as you can see, the AV node, right behind the tricuspid valve between the uh, right atrium and the right ventricle. Uh, okay. So there's again three types of AV nodal cells, and this this time they're split into the location-wise, so atrial nodal zones, central nodal zones, and the nodal his zones. And the most probably the most important bit of uh, physiology uh, occurring here is the fact that there's a delay in the prop propagation of the excitation wave for around a hundred milliseconds, and this allows the atria to completely empty their blood all into the ventricles and this is achieved by a slow conduction of the AV node and it's actually slower than the other uh, pacemaker cells uh, and this is due to the fact that it has diminished diminished number of gap junctions so you have fewer ions fewer cations being uh, shared between the cells slower ion channels so again uh, the cell can't receive as many cations and the fibers have a smaller di uh, di diameter. So obviously, if you had a larger diameter, the conduction velocity would be much faster. But um, yeah, there you go. So a bundle of Hiss is a continuation of the AV node. It gives us the left and the right bundle branches that run subendocardially down both sides of the interatrial septum and transmit the uh, action potential to the Purkinje fibers. The bundle of Hiss is the only conducting tissue between the atria and ventricles. So, uh, because there's there's a non-conducting fibrous tissue ring between the atria and the ventricles. So, as you can see here, the, the only possible way for uh, the conduction to go through is through the bundle of Hiss and down into the atrial septum. And the Purkinje fibers reach all the way down to the bottom of the ventricles, as you saw in the picture. And the special thing about the Purkinje fibers is that they're the tertiary pacemaker, and they set a pace of 20 beats per minute. And I think I forgot to mention, yeah, so the atrioventricular node is the secondary pacemaker, 
setting at 40 beats per minute. I'll get onto that later as well. And uh, the special thing about Perkinia fibers is the fact that they have the fastest uh, conductivity. Cool. And uh, obviously this graph is very important. It's a graph of the action potential of a working cardiomyocyte, so a contractile, contractile cardiomyocyte. Not to be confused with an action potential graph of a pacemaker cell. That's different. So we're talking about a contractile cardiomyocyte following uh, phase, so it has the following phases, four, zero, one, two, and three. So I'll get to the details later. All right, so in phase four, we have a resting membrane potential of around minus 90 microvolts, as you can see here. So in this picture, it says minus 96. Um, so a resting membrane potential of around minus 90 microvolts. And then in phase zero, this is the depolarization phase, because there is an influx of these cations, these sodium cations. And I'll explain where they come from in a minute. But generally, they come from uh, the, all the in, first of all, the channels and also the gap junctions between the pacemaker cells and the contractile cardiomyocytes. There's a better picture later on. So again, phase zero is depolarization with sodium ions coming inside the cell. Phase one is early repolarization. At this point, there is a efflux, so potassium ions are leaving the cell. So that means let fewer cations within within the cell, within inside the cell. So there's repolarize early repolarization going on again. But around this time, you have the plateau phase, and that's because you have an influx of calcium ions. So calcium uh, long-lasting. So this is here is a CAL. You have the long-lasting calcium ions, a channel op channels opening, and you have an influx of the calcium ions coming in. And then around uh, after the phase two, just before phase three, these calcium channels close, and you have uh, you no longer have an influx of these calcium ions. You only have an efflux of these potassium ions leaving the cell. So that's why again in phase three there's repolarization because there's fewer cations within the cell and it goes back into the resting membrane potential. All right, so during phase three, obviously the uh, ch calcium ch ch channels close, which means an efflux of potassium ions. And uh, due to the plateau phase, the cardiac muscles are able to stay contracted for longer than skeletal muscles. So because you have this long 200 millisecond phase of calcium ions flowing in, uh, the cardiac muscle is able to stay contracted. Again, we're talking about a contractile cardiomyocyte, not a pacemaker cell. So it has within it, within it myofibrils and sarcomeres uh, that are able to contract because they're these cells have contractility. All right, and now we have a few conduction velocities and pacemaking impulses. As you can see, only the primary, secondary, and tertiary pacemakers have pacemaking impulses per minute, obviously because sinoatrial node is the fastest one, uh, atrioventricular node, again, 40 to 55 uh, impulses per minute. And uh, if you're talking about conduction velocity, as mentioned previously, Perkinier fibers are definitely the fastest. And there's an important uh, phenomenon here. I think too much uh, information, but it might be too much information for the final, but it's called the overdrive suppression phenomenon. And uh, here, as you can see, the as long as the SA node, which is the primary pacemaker cell, if it's... Um, always providing this number, these numbers, it will always be the primary pacemaker. But if it's not functioning properly, then the uh, the, the job of a pacemaking ability goes to the AV node or the Perkinier fibers. And so the fact that it's called overdrive, overdrive suppression, it means that as long as the SA node is functioning, the AV node and the Perkinier fibers don't have a pacemaking ability. Well, they do, but it's suppressed. All right, so cardiac automaticity. 1% uh, of all the cardiomyocytes are pacemaker cells, only 1%. And again, they have automaticity is the intrinsic ability to generate an, uh, a cardiac, an action potential within the cardiomyocyte. And the pacemaker cells have, uh, actually, so 
this might be a little bit incorrect. It's wrong to assume that they have a resting membrane potential of minus 60 millivolts, as I'll explain later. But um, the special thing about pacemakers is that they have a what's called a hyperpolarization activated cyclic nucleotide gated channels, HCN channels, which activate when the membrane potential reaches minus 65. And that's why I wouldn't say it's a resting membrane potential, because it's never actually at rest. Because as soon as it reaches a minus 65 millivolts, it gets activated and then these channels let in sodium ions. And these sodium ions is called the funny current. Now this is the action potential graph of a pacemaker cell, as you can see here. So imagine uh, we hit minus 65 mi mi millivolts and these HCN channels, this uh, hyperpolarization activated channels, uh, get activated and they have an, there's an influx of this funny current which is sodium. Sodium is the funny current and then it also gets helped by the transient T cells, uh, so, uh, transient calcium, ch calcium channels that have an influx of calcium and that helps it reach the threshold and we'll come to that in a minute. So phase four again uh, not really resting membrane potential of minus 60 microvolts and a funny current shifts it to the threshold voltage of minus 30 microvolts, helping the transient T-type type, type channel, uh, yeah, helped by the transient T-type type calcium channels. Uh, and so phase zero here is depolarization. And this threshold is actually the threshold for the activation of long-lasting calcium channels, these L-type calcium channels. So here, depolarization, influx of calcium channels via long-lasting L-type calcium channels. And again, as with the action potential of the con contractile cardiomyocyte, we have repolarization due to the efflux, that's the exiting of uh, potassium ions, potassium cations. And again, no phases one or two for a pacemaker cell. It doesn't have early repolarization and it doesn't have a plateau phase. So that's special about a pacemaker cell. And the other special thing is that its, it's membrane potential never re really reaches, never really goes below minus 65 microvolts. Whereas with uh, a conducting, uh, sorry, a working cardiomyocyte, the resting membrane potential is minus 96 microvolts. And to summarize, so this is a nice little picture of this. You have both, both charts, both graphs in the same picture here. Uh, the SA node and the contractile myocardium. And to sum up, so you have depolarization happening here. So reaching the threshold here, re depolarization because these calcium channels are activated and they allow an influx of calcium ions. And, and then repolarization again because these potassium channels open up and there's an efflux of potassium ions. And they go again. And so here, as you can see, uh, the influx of sodium in this contractile my my in this contractile myocardium is not only from the opening of uh, sodium channels here, but also because the all these cations are passing through from the sinoatrial node or whatever pacemaker cell into this contractile myocardium through gap junctions. So all these cations are traveling through gap junctions to this contractile myocardium. There's a picture here as well. So we have this. What is uh, an intercalated disc, so it allows the heart to function as a functional syncytium, and it's composed of a desmosome and a gap junction. These gap junctions allow this ionic flow, therefore this electric current, and the desmosomes help them stick together. So when you're when the heart is functioning and it's stretching, um, it doesn't it doesn't fall apart, and these gap junctions stay together, and these ions can flow through them constantly. And uh, we'll get to this later as well. Uh, this is more to do with the heart rate. So factors determining the heart rate, maximal diastolic voltage, which is which can be kind of the the lowest point at which this graph is. So minus 60 or minus 60, 65. And obviously this is a factor determining the heart rate because if this was higher, then you wouldn't have to reach as much to get to the threshold. And there's the steepness of diastolic activation this is this can be described as a slope 
So the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system, this is what they affect, the slope. So if the slope is steeper, it's going to reach the threshold much faster and we're going to have an action potential much sooner. And there's also the threshold voltage for activation of the long-lasting calcium channels. This is also another factor determining the heart rate. And that's because if the threshold was much lower, by uh, if it was down here, then you wouldn't have to reach as far to activate the long-lasting calcium channels. And this is helped by the sympathetic nervous stimulation. So that's what it does. Uh, as you can see here, this dotted line is the normal action potential of a cardiomyocyte. Uh, sorry, a pacemaker cell. And this and the sympathetic stimulation increases the uh, intracellular level of cyclic AMP, thus increasing the slope and inevitably the excitability. And PNS stimulation does exactly the opposite. Again, I'll get to this. Uh, I'll explain these in detail further later. later on. All right. So question time. Uh, so I'll check the comments down below. Uh, if you can answer. So question one is, there's only four or five questions in this whole PowerPoint. So choose the incorrect statement. Uh, A, cardiac depolarization is delayed in the AVN by, so the atrioventricular node by 0.1 second. The action, B, the action potential graph of a working cardiomyocyte doesn't have phases one or two. C, pacemaker cells have this special hyperpolarization activated cyclic nucleotide gated channels. And D, the threshold voltage for the activation of long-lasting calcium channels is around minus 30 microvolts. So I'll give you some time to work that. All right, so, and the correct answer is B. Uh, yeah, everyone got that right. So, uh, obviously, uh, it's the incorrect one because the action potential graph of a pacemaker cell is the one that doesn't have a phase one or two. Uh, an action potential graph of a working cardiomyocyte definitely does have uh, a phase one or two. And here, this is correct obviously the delay is 0.1 seconds or 100 milliseconds pacemaker cells do have these special channels um, and the threshold voltage is around minus 30 microvolts so all right another easier question choose the correct statement this time uh, a the excitability excitability definition is the ability to contract in response to the electric impulse b the atrioventricular node is right behind the mitral valve C, the conduction velocity of the bundle of His is 4 meters per second. Um, and D, the plateau phase, phase 2, allows cardiomyocytes to stay contracted for longer than skeletal muscles. All right, so the correct answer is D, of course, because the plateau phase, phase two, allows cardiomyocytes to stay contracted for much longer than skeletal cells. Uh, these are all incorrect statements, and I'll explain why. Because C, here, you have uh, the conduction velocity of the bundle of His is four meters per second. That's incorrect. It is one meters per second, as, as we have. Here, yeah, bundle of his conduction velocity is one meters per second. Purkinje fibers have a conduction velocity of four meters per second. Uh, yeah, uh, the atrioventricular node is right behind the mitral valve. That is also incorrect. It's the atrioventricular node is right behind the tricuspid valve. Mitral valve is also known as the bicuspid. That's on the left side of the heart, and the atrioventricular node is right behind the tricuspid valve. So that's incorrect. Uh, option A, excitability is the ability to contract in response to the electric impulse. That's incorrect. 
contractility is the ability to contract in response to an electrical impulse, and excitability is just merely to respond to an electrical impulse. All right, let's get to the basics of ECG. Electrocardiography is the process of recording the electrical activity of the heart. It's formed of 10 electrodes that give off 12 leads. And when you're looking at uh, an ECG, you're always thinking about which way the wave of depolarization is occurring. So generally, we look at when we're looking at a lead, the it's coming from the negative electrode to the positive electrode. And this is a wave of depolarization because uh, as you saw before with the cells, they're becoming depolarized and then they, they, with the use of gap junctions and acting as a functional syncytium, there's a, there's a wave of depolarization occurring. So, and here, as you can see, negative electrode here, positive electrode here, um, a wave of depolarization occurring towards the positive electrode gives a positive deflection on the ECG graph and a wave of depolarization uh, traveling away from the positive electrode it gives off a negative deflection uh, on, the, on the ECG graph and obviously if it's perpendicular it gives an isoelectric thing. and also to note I'm only talking about a wave of depolarization it's completely different with a wave of repolarization because wave of repolarization would be the exact opposite. So if it was a wave of repolarization, which is negative energy, if it was traveling towards the positive electrode, there would be a negative deflection. And if the wave of repolarization was traveling away from the positive electrode, well, there would be a negative deflection. And I think it's important here when we have, this is your average uh, PQRST of an ECG. So you have the representations here. So P is atrial depolarization, the Q wave here, septal depolarization. I'll explain, I'll explain why they're positive and negative deflections later on. But uh, as you can see here, R is ventricular depolarization, S is ventricular base depolarization, and T is ventricular repolarization. And this is I think this is a very important, these are very important values to remember, the length of each wave. And as you can see here, I've put PQ segment and ST segment, these segments here. And a segment is not the same thing as an interval. An interval is from the start of one wave to the start of the next one. So if I say PQ interval, it includes the P wave. Whereas if I say PQ segment, it's just from after the P wave has finished to before the Q wave has started. All right, so this is what I mean by a 10, 10 leads, 10 leads causing, uh, creating 12, uh, sorry, 10 electrodes creating 12, uh, 12 leads. So you have the left, left arm, right arm, and right leg and left leg, and you put the green or the, yeah, the green electrode on the left foot, the yellow electrode on the left arm, the red electrode on the right arm, and the neutral one on the right foot. And obviously this is a very insignificant electrode. There's a triangle created with these three electrodes. And you can kind of imagine that it's around the pubis area here. It creates this imaginary triangle that's useful for electrocardiography. And obviously we have the chest leads and I'll talk about the placement later on as well. But that's the fact. That's the basics of it. The fact that there's uh, 10 electrodes creating 12, 12 leads. So right, spread and retreat of excitation wavefront. Uh, so the propagation of an action potential occurs only in one direction, obviously because there's a ring of non-conductive fibrous tissue in between. So there's no, there's no re-entering. Or there shouldn't be anyway. And if there was, it's pathological. An electrical dipole movement is a measure of the separation between positive and negative changes within a system. It's a measure of polarity. And uh, this is the, if I was if I was to say there's anything, if I was going to memorize anything in this thing, it would be this one, word by word. This is taken straight from the presentation uh, made by Masaryk. So the electric vector of the heart, so cardiac vectors consist of sum of momentary dipoles on the depolarization wavefront 
and represents both magnitude and direction of an action potential generated by a myocyte. I think memorize this word by word. They really like hearing this. And they express the direction of the ventricular activi activation and can reflect both asymmetry in the ventricular wall thickness and also the position of the heart and the chest. This is very important. It doesn't, an ECG cannot directly show you where the heart will be inside the chest, but you can derive it using these cardiac vectors. And I'll show you how you can estimate one later on. So the electrical axis is the reflection of the average direction of the ventricular depolarization, not to be confused with the ve cardiac vectors. This is the definition of cardiac vectors. Electrical axis is completely different. It's the reflection of the average direction of the ventricular depolarization. And the normal heart axis is between minus 30 degrees and plus 110. These are the official values given to us by the university, and these are the ones I would remember. And obviously, right axis deviation is anything beyond uh, plus 110 degrees. Uh, so this can be caused by right ventricular hypertrophy. So uh, I'll come on to a picture later on. Um, and left axis deviation is anything beyond, is anything under minus 30 degrees. It's caused by left ventricular hypertrophy, pregnancy, and obesity. All right, to sum up, I'll tell you now why uh, they have a positive and a ne negative deflection. So an atrial, de atrial depolarization is positive deflection because imagine if I, uh, imagine we had lead two here. Uh, oops. So that's a negative electrode, and this is a positive electrode, and this is lead two, right? We're measuring lead two. And this uh, wave of depolarization, because depolarization is occurring here, and it's going towards the positive electrode, which is why you have a positive deflection. Septal depolarization, however, is going, if you can see, kind of perpendicular, but more towards the negative electrode, which is why you have a negative deflection, because it's a wave of depolarization going away from the electro uh, positive electrode here. And again here, you have again a positive deflection from the isoelectric line because it's going to it's a wave of depolarization towards the positive electrode. And again here, this is the base. I would say it's the base of the ventricular depolarization of the ventricular base because it's going away from the positive electrode. It's a wave of depolarization away from the positive electrode, which is why you have a negative deflection. And please try and, this is, I couldn't find a better image, so please try and don't focus on this arrow here, it's wrong. Uh, there's a positive electrode here, negative electrode here. Imagine the wave of repolarization this time, because this is ventricular repolarization. Uh, it's going away from the positive electrode. So if there was a ventricular repolarization going towards the positive electrode, it would have been a negative deflection. But because it's, it's a wave of negative energy, if you will, ventricular repolarization going away from the positive electrode, you have a positive deflection. And that's why T wave is a positive reflection. And you might be wondering, where's atrial repolarization? It's actually buried somewhere within the QRS complex. You can't read it on an ECG. All right, so question time again. Question three, choose the incorrect statement. Uh, P wave is atrial contraction. B, uh, left axis deviation is caused by obesity. Uh, re C, repolarization of the heart towards the positive electrode produces a negative deflection. Or D, the normal heart axis is between minus 30 degrees to plus 110 degrees. All right, so the right answer is A, and this is because I know it's quite annoying 
but P wave does not represent atrial contraction. This is incorrect. P wave represents atrial depolarization. Uh, this is the, so choose the incorrect, so left axis deviation is caused by obesity, that is correct. Repolarization of the heart towards the positive electrode produces a negative deflection. So I see a few people got this wrong, wrong, so I'll explain why again. So we have here ventricular repolarization. It's a wave of negative energy going away from the positive electrode and it produces a positive deflection. Positive deflection because it's going away from the positive electrode but it's a wave of negative energy. It's a wave of ventricular repolarization. Which is why here, if you had repolarization of the heart going towards the positive electrode, it produces a negative deflection. Uh, Alright, so let's get on to the actual leads themselves. So electrocardiography again is a process of recording the electrical activity of the heart and an ECG provides information on heart position, relative chamber size, heart rhythm, and impulse origin and propagation. And I think these, these four points are very important to remember on what an ECG can actually provide because an ECG cannot provide information on many other things like the functioning of the pump itself, like how the heart functions as a pump itself, and blood pressure and things like that. So an electrode records the electrical potential, whereas a lead is the connection between these two electrodes and records the potential difference, the voltage, if you will, between the two electrodes. And there's different kinds of leads. So you have bipolar leads, which measure the potential difference between a positive and a negative electrode. In an ECG, this is, this is the Einthoven's limb leads, and I'll come on to a picture of them later. Whereas unipolar leads have an active one active electrode and another indifferent reference electrode. So obviously unipolar, so there's no negative, there's no negative or positive here, just one ele neg active electrode and an indifferent re reference electrode. In an ECG, this is the Wilson's chest leads and the augmented Goldberg leads. Uh, is it necessary to name, remember the names? I don't think so, but Eindhoven's limb leads, Wilson's chest leads, and augmented Goldberg leads. And essentially what all these leads do is they allow you to look at the heart from different planes. So the Eindhoven's limb leads and the augmented Goldberg leads can help you look at the heart from a frontal plane. That is, if you chop me in half, you separate me between anterior and posterior half, if you understand. Uh, Wilson's chest leads is in a horizontal plane, and they're usually on the left side of the chest, these chest leads. All right. And uh, the triangle that I was talking about before, Eindhoven's triangle, is an imaginary formation of the three limb leads in a triangle formed by the two shoulders and the pubis. And this is the imaginary triangle. So. I'm talking about the Einthoven limb leads here. You place a negative electrode on the right arm and a positive electrode on the, uh, on, the, on the foot and you get lead two, which is looking at the heart from the bottom. So imagine if you had your eye here, you're looking at the, you're looking at the heart from the bottom around this angle. Whereas if you place a negative electrode on the right arm again, and then a positive electrode on the left arm, you'd be looking at the heart from a lateral left view. Because imagine if you had your eye here. The energy is coming towards you, wave of depolarization coming towards you. So you now have a view of the heart from this direction. And then again, negative electrode here, positive electrode here. As we said, the uh, electrode placements, yellow, green, uh, yeah, yeah, yellow, green, uh, uh, green, uh, black and red, red for right arm, and then this gives lead leads one, two, and three. One between the arms, two here, three here. And when you're talking about an, uh, a classic ECG, uh, the, you, we actually look we're actually looking at a lead two. So when I mentioned, so when we saw here, this is actually a lead two. So if you understand, negative positive between the right arm and the foot. Uh, lead two. It's an Einthoven's limb leads, a bipolar leads. 
So Wilson's chest leads, and they're special because they have a transverse section, so cutting the body from superior and uh, inferior. So you have the chest leads, and they show they show the energy coming towards the chest cavity. So it's a chest wall. So, so oops. So as you can see, coming through the chest wall. So and there's six six electrodes placed on the chest. The position that they're placed on uh, is here. So the first one is the right is the only one that's right on the right side of the chest. The first one, the chest lead one, is on the fourth intercostal space. So first you press against the person's angle of Louis, which is usually palpable, and the first, second, third, fourth intercostal space. That's where you place the first one, and then exactly on the left side you place the second one. Forget the third one for now. Mid clavicular line, fifth intercostal space. You place the fourth chest lead, and then in between those, you place the third one. Anterior axillary line is where the fifth chest lead goes, and then the mid axillary line is where the sixth chest lead goes. Again, these are all the Wilson's chest leads, and they are unipolar, not bipolar, and they're transverse on a transverse plane. They look at the heart on a transverse plane, as you can see here. Left ventricle, left uh, right ventricle, you're actually looking at the top top of the heart, so it's here. So, augmented Goldberg leads. Uh, it's, important to note, uh, it's important to note that AVR stands for augmented vector right, and AVL means augmented vector left, augmented vector foot, AVF, augmented vector foot. And as you can see, there's these um, uh, degrees here. Minus 30, minus 50, plus 90 here. And these are all part, they'll all be part of the hex axial system, which is a necessary diagram to know for the final. And you have AVF, AVR, and AVF. Sorry, AVL, AVR, AVF. And you can, and this is, this definitely needs to be memorized, the angle at which they see the heart. And again, these are also unipolar. There's, the reference electrode is at the center of the heart, is the Wilson central terminal for them, for these unipolar ones. Whereas leads one, uh, two, and three, they're bipolar limb leads. So this is Eindhoven's triangle again. And these are all the leads involved one, two, AVL, AVF, negative, positive between leads one for lead one, lead two negative here, positive here, and also here negative, positive. Think about the foot as always being positive, the right arm as always being negative, and you can work the rest out. Again, imagine if your eye is here, so lead one is helping you look at the left side of the heart. And imagine if your eye was here, leads two is helping, leads two, three, AVF, they're all look, helping you look at the bottom, the bottom of the heart, as if you were here. I was here, if you were placed here, it's helping you look at the bottom of the heart. This is the hexaxial system, as I said. It's, an, it's very important to know these values, of course. Uh, AVR is minus 150 or 210. Uh, it's, it's 60, 120. It's very important to know these. All right, so again, cardiac vectors, very important to memorize this. Cardiac vectors consist of the sum of momentary dipoles on the depolarization wavefront and represent both magnitude and direction of an actual potential generated by a myocyte. It expresses direction of a ventricular activation, as we saw, and can reflect both asymmetry in the ventricular wall thickness and the position of the heart and the chest. And the electric axis, which is different, is a reflection of the average direction of the ventricular depolarization. And this is what we're going to do. Estimation of the electrical axis. Because the normal heart axis is between minus 30 and 110. I'll explain why. All right, so I actually got this. This is a screenshot from the university PowerPoint. And I've honestly, there isn't much better on the internet. So when you're looking for an electric, how do you estimate an electrical axis of the heart? You're looking for the average deviation of the QRS complex because we are looking for the 
we're de it's expressing the direction of the ventricular activation. So we're looking at the average deviation of the QRS complex. So the isoelectric line is here, and you look at the Q wave, minus 1. So lead 1 is giving lead 1 here. On the ECG, it's giving minus 1, the Q wave. And then you count the squares, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. R is 5. S is minus 1. And you add this up, and that's what we mean by sum of momentary dipoles on the depolarization wavefront. Wave you add these up, you get five, 3, 5, and 4. And then you put this onto a hexaxial system, negative to positive. You start in the middle, right? And on positive, you count towards the positive electrode, always towards the positive electrode. So if it's 3, 1, 2, 3 and on the lead on the leads two or again start in the middle count towards the positive electrode here we have minus one plus six and then zero it's on the isoelectric line there is no s wave here and it can you can do an it's usually done on leads one and two that's how you get this average and then you combine them and where they meet is here you draw a line from the center of the hexaxial system, and then that's your average. That's your average uh, electrical axis, and it's usually between minus thirty and one hundred and ten degrees Celsius. But if it's anything more than one hundred and if it's anything uh, more here and more here, then it's deviation. All right. So question four: Choose the correct statement. A, the augmented Goldberg leads are in a sagittal plane. And you're going to need to remember your anatomy key terms here. B, Wilson's chest lead is an example of a bipolar lead. C, the fourth chest lead is on the right side of the sternum. And D, information on whether a person has dextrocardia can be derived from an ECG. I'll wait for the answers. So anyone with an answer? All right, okay, so the answer for this one is D. This is the correct statement because an ECG can help you find out if uh, the position of the heart, as I mentioned in the previous slide, so the right axis deviation, left axis deviation, can help you find an ECG is gonna be very useful behind the heart's position inside the chest. So dextrocardia, which is um, when a person has the heart on the right side of the chest, dextrocardia, uh, can, it can be derived from an ECG. So this is the correct statement. Fourth chest lead on the left side of the sternum, so this is incorrect. Uh, Wilson's chest lead is an example of a unipolar lead uh, because there's a reference indifferent uh, reference electrode involved. And the augmented Goldberg leads are are not in the sagittal plane. So if you guys have forgotten, uh, it's in the frontal plane. And that's not the same thing as sagittal because it is a quick thing. Sagittal is left and right. Left and right. Whereas frontal split that way from ear to ear. Frontal over here. It's posterior. And, uh, sorry, posterior and anterior. Frontal splits you into posterior and anterior. Transverse is top and bottom. And that's what the Wilson's chest term, uh, chest electrodes do. Whereas the other two, they're in frontal plane. All right, uh, so this is a very easy question. 
uh, you only need to memorize one graph for this question. Uh, polygraphy is a recording of several physiological signals at the same time. You might have heard of it as a lie detector test. Uh, so it's fun, uh, involves three things. Uh, it's the phonocardiography, which records the heart sounds using a microphone. Uh, and an ECG, which is uh, obviously measures the heart's electrical activity. And a sphygmography, which records the arterial pulse wave. And here's the graph here. Uh, very important graph. They can ask you this anytime. Doesn't matter what question you have. Obviously, if it's related to cardiovascular, I think they can ask you this graph. Has an EC again, it has an ECG, PQRST normally, uh, phonocardiography, which records the heart sounds using a microphone and a signal graph. This is diastolic blood pressure, systolic blood pressure. So that's what that measures. S1 is the closure of atrioventricular valves. S2 is the closure of the mitral valves. Sorry, the semilunar valves. And here we have isovolumic contraction, ejection phase, isovolumic relaxation. And this is all to do with the cardiac cycles, which I won't cover here, which will be in the next lecture. And it's important to note, S1, which is the first heart sound, due to the closure of the atrioventricular valves, is occurring just after the R wave. So during the QRS complex. And S2 is occurring during the T wave. During the T wave. S2 is due to the closure, of course, of semilunar valves. So the heart sounds, which I would say is... So if it sounds like there's not much information for each question, that's because I would say if you get a question, it covers more of the... They, cover, they want to cover more of the topic than the actual question itself. And so they can ask you about pretty much anything. So if you get heart sounds, which I did in my final, they asked me to draw this entire graph, which I think was very necessary. They asked me to draw the specifics of how the S2 fits inside the T wave. And it's also, I think, a question in the final. All right, so heart sounds are detectable because of the vibrations caused by turbulence due to the blood velocity exceeding the Reynolds number of laminar flow. And there's four of them. There's actually four heart sounds. There's not just two. So S1 is due to the closure of the atrioventricular valves, has a low frequency, and it's that lub noise, lub dub, so it's the first one. S2 is the closure of the semilunar valves, has a high frequency. And S3, usually physiological in young people, it's heard in the first third of diastole, very important to know, first third of diastole, physiological in young people, but usually pathological. So if you, when you're listening to an old person using a, uh, so ascutation, it's usually pathological. It's due to rapid ventricular failure. Uh, S4 is always pathological. Is due to atrial systole and therefore is heard before S1. So here, during ventricular atrial filling, it's heard here, before S1. It's always pathological. Systolic pause is the time interval between S1 and S2, whereas diastolic pause is the time interval between S2 and S1. So that's the ending of S1 and the beginning of the next one. So systolic pause, and diastolic pause between S1, between the end of S1 and the start of the next S1. It's heard by auscultation and murmurs, uh, abnormal heart sounds, and they indicate stenosis or regurgitation. And this is the, this is where you can, the optimum sound, the optimum part for each valve you can listen to by auscultation. I think it's necessary to know each one. I think it's uh, checking. Oh, no. Okay. So the second intercostal space on the right side of the sternum is for the aortic valve, which is actually here, but you can best hear it here. Second intercostal space on the left side of the sternum, so the pulmonary valve. Fifth intercostal space here, tricuspid valve, even though it's here and mitral valve heard a little bit lower here 
the apex, so the bottom of the heart. And somewhere here, you have the herbs point, which is the external, it's, called, it's actually the external manifestation of the heart's function. And it's kind of usually where you hear the, the heartbeat, the heart loudest. All right, so heart rate and its regulation. So heart rate itself is the number of cardiac cycles in one minute. Um, it's physiological value, 72 beats per minute, obviously, measured in an ECG using RR intervals. And it's the most changeable and therefore the most exerting effect on the cardiac output. So the equation for cardiac output, very important. Cardiac output is, the, is heart rate times stroke volume. And the regulation of heart rate is divided into the intrinsic and extrinsic regulation. I won't go into the intrinsic regulation much on this presentation, but it will be on the next one. But uh, intrinsic regulation includes the automaticity of the heart, which is the intrinsic ability to generate an action potential, very special for the pacemaker cells of the heart. The Starling mechanism, or the Frank Starling law, and the frequency effect mechanism. Of course, both of these will be explained further on the next, next presentation. And then uh, extrin extrinsic regulation is by the autonomic nervous system. So the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. And that's what we're going to talk about here. So it's important to differentiate between the different kinds of changes. So when you're affecting the heart rate, when the heart rate is going up, or down because of the sympathetic or the parasympathetic nervous system, you're affecting the chronotropism. It's the chronotropism. Not to be confused with the dromotropism, which is when the conduction speed of the electrical impulses are changed. And the, sign, and the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system also affect dromotropism as well as ionotropism and chronotropism. Ionotropism is myocardial contractility. It directly correlates the intracellular calcium levels within inside the cell. And usually the sympathetic nervous system causes a, a positive chronotropism, positive dromotropism, and positive ionotropism, whereas the parasympathetic nervous system causes a negative effect, causes a negative chronotropism, negative dromotropism, and negative ionotropism. Again, we come to the previous slide, as mentioned before. The factors determining the heart rate are the maximum diastolic voltage. So it's this part here. Obviously, if it was higher or lower, it would very much affect how quickly the threshold was reached. And obviously, moving the threshold voltage for the activation of long-lasting long calcium channels takes, play, takes into effect as well. So if this was much lower, it would be easier to reach the threshold but it's mainly the slope that's affected. So the sympathetic nervous system, if you affect the slope, the rate of depolarization, you have more action potentials. So that's what the sympathetic nervous system is doing. The parasympathetic nervous system is slowing down the slope, and you get fewer action potentials. Like here, that's better. I don't know why I drew. Uh, so parasympathetic nervous system uh, simulation is a smaller slope. Slope, yeah, it's not steep. Where well, sympathetic st stimulation is a very steep slope. And there's more cyclic AMP and a higher excitability. And I think these two graphs are probably the most important graphs you have or you'll need for biochemistry and physiology. And I think it's in one of the biochemistry handouts that they give you. And I think these two graphs kind of saved my life with understanding how these work. So let me tell you first about cholinergic synapse, which is any synapse where acetylcholine is involved. And acetylcholine can be released by both preganglionic and postganglionic fibers of the parasympathetic nervous system, right? Whereas an adrenergic synapse involves adrenaline or noradrenaline. They, they're the neurotransmitters inside an adrenergic synapse. Whereas in a cholinergic synapse, the neurotransmitter released by the fibers are, is acetylcholine. And it can affect nicotinic um, channels, 
and muscarinic channels. These are two subtypes. And then obviously, sorry, these are two types, and then obviously there are M1, M3, M5, M2, and M4, which are subtypes. And this is what they cause. And I think these two graphs are very important to memorize, and it will be very useful to understand when talking about uh, heart rate and its regulation. So because each, uh, as you can see here, each adrenergic synapse, so the sympathetic nervous system, on its postganglionic fibers, releases adrenaline and noradrenaline, and it can affect these adrenergic receptors, A, alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, and beta-2. And the and it, their second messenger and their effect is usually down to the what kind of G protein they have. So as you can see, alpha-1 uh, receptors have a GQ protein attached to them. And the type of G protein will tell you what kind of effect the sympathetic or the parasympathetic um, nervous system will have on the chosen organ. And I'll explain here. So you have a sympathetic nerve, postganglionic fibers, neuro, uh, so this norepinephrine, so noradrenaline, is being released, right? And is attaching on. So this is now. So if this is noradrenaline, what kind of synapse is this? This is an adrenergic synapse, right? And we're talking about a cardiac cell. Uh, forget this. This is a smooth muscle. We don't need this. Uh, and we have here. It attaches to a beta one receptor, which is attached to a G stimulatory protein, which converts ATP into a cyclic AMP. This is now the second messenger, as seen here. So beta one noradrenaline on the heart, beta-1 receptor attached to a G-stimulatory protein that converts ATP into cyclic AMP and there's an increase in intracellular levels of cyclic AMP. And this in turn activates protein kinase A. Whenever you hear the term kinase, that means it's phosphorylating something. And so it can phosphorylate calcium channels to get more calcium inside the cell. And this is a contractile cardiac cell. So this can occur uh, on a pacemaker cell too. And if it's occurring on a pacemaker cell, more calcium AMP will cause there to be, uh, will cause an activation of protein kinase A, which phosphorylates uh, channels to increase the number of cations coming into the cell. And if there's more cations coming into the cell, depolarization obviously it's going to happen faster. So that's why the slope is increasing. So as you can see here, cyclic AMP, increased levels of intracellular cyclic AMP. It is um, activating protein kinase A, which phosphorylates these calcium channels to have an influx of calcium uh, into the cell. And there will be more cations inside the cell. And so they can cause calcium-induced calcium response, which means, you know, this getting into the the territory of uh, excitation contraction coupling, which is a separate question in itself, but generally it increase, uh, increases contraction, increases the heart rate. That's what we're talking about. Yeah. And this is only sympathetic nervous system. And when we're talking about the parasympathetic nervous system, you want to look at this this one right here. Right. So it's a, acting on a muscarinic, because there's two types of receptors. Acetylcholine can affect a nicotinic one, which is just a simple ionic channel. There's no G protein attached to it, and it works via ions. So an influx of ions is what causes there to be a change. Whereas the muscarinic uh, channel has these GQ proteins or GI proteins that can affect the amounts of cyclic AMP, or if it, in terms of GQ, increase uh, diacylglycerol and inositol triphosphate. And that's a different mechanism on its own. But if we're talking about the parasympathetic nervous system acting on the heart, it increase it secretes acetylcholine. So this is now a cholinergic, cholinergic synapse. So we're dealing with the first graph here. So uh, first table here, right? And it attaches to M2, an M2 receptor. As you can see here, an M2 receptor is attached to a G inhibitory protein that decreases the levels of intracellular cyclic AMP. So when it's attached to G, uh, G protein, this is G inhibitory. G inhibitory. Decreases the level of cyclic AMP. And as I mentioned before, because 
A G stimulant protein causes increase in cyclic AMP. PNS does the opposite. PNS decreases the levels of cyclic AMP, or parts of the G protein activates uh, uh, calcium ions, causing there to be an efflux of potassium. Potassium ion efflux, which means the cell is more negative. And that, in turn, decreases the slope. Here, yeah, the decrease of the slope. That's what we mean. Because there's a decrease of cyclic AMP, decrease in the rate of depolarization, and decreased excitability, therefore a decreased heart rate. And yeah, that's it. And last question for today, we are dealing with arrhythmias. And this question is more in the realms of pathology, but I would say, uh, again, uh, try and come through this question in terms of definition and the types. So definition of arrhythmia is any kind of disturbance in the impulse generation and conduction. So let's get, let's get through the types and let's get through the basic types. So tachycardia is actually technically an arrhythmia. Even though it's benign, it's completely physiological. Uh, it's a fast heart rate. Slow heart rate, which is seen in uh, athletes, is also benign. It's, it can also be benign. And bradycardia is when it's a very slow heart rate, below 60 beats per minute. Sinus respiratory arrhythmias, which we'll come on to in the next slide. Six sinus, same, and extrasystole. Uh, flutter and fibrillation, re-entry, and heart block. Heart block is a very important one. It's prolonged PR interval over two, 0.2 seconds. Whenever the PR interval, and that includes the P wave, remember, because PR segment does not include the P wave. PR interval includes the P wave. And if it's longer than 0.2 seconds, that means there's some kind of heart block. I'll explain that in a minute. All right, so sinus respiratory arrhythmias is when the heart rate is faster due to ins uh, during inspiration and slower during expiration. And the mechanism of how this happens is as follows. So first you inspire, and the intrathoracic pressure is decreased, obviously, because the volume inside your thorax has increased. So the uh, pressure inside the intrathoracic cavity has decreased, and therefore there's a lower blood pressure. Because there's, if you think about the chest cavity, so this is the chest cavity, and this is the abdominal cavity. If you have decreased pressure here, decreased intrathoracic pressure, there's going to be a higher venous return coming from the abdomen. So there's going to be increased venous return. But, and so for now, there'll be a decreased blood pressure within, within inside this chest cavity. And this activates baroreceptors. Okay? This is all to do with the baroreflex. And because there's decreased blood pressure inside, activation of the baroreceptors will suppress the vagal tone, causing an increased heart rate, which is why when you inspire, your heart rate increases. If you have any questions, please, please ask them now. I think this can be a very difficult concept to understand. And this all occurs um, in the respiratory center, cardiomotor center in the middle of the blood. Extrasystole is when there's a heart, heartbeat outside the normal rhythm. So it's followed by a pause and then the heart electrical system resets, kind of resets itself. So it's not like normal. So if there's a if there's a scar in your heart, like here, and there's a normal pathway here, but it can't go through here. So it has to go around it and it can cause re-excitation. It can go around and cause re-excitation because these can't depolarize. They depolarize here, depolarize here, and they go back and re-enter, causing, uh, so this is what it causes, paroxysmal tachycardia, because these these cells, these myocardial cells get uh, depolarized again, causing paroxysmal tachycardia, which is a rapid discharge of impulses due to re-entry of the wave of excitation, because the wave of excitation going around the scar here, it can, cause, it can be caused by multiple things, but usually a defect of some sort to the cardiomyocyte, so it re-enters. And this is an example of this is a uh, Wolf Parkinson White syndrome, which is a condition where there's an extra electrical pathway in the heart. I think it's called the pathway of Kent. 
so there's an extra pathway, and so this can this is a opportunity for the wave of excitation to cause a re-entry and a re and again uh, leading to periods of rapid rapid heart rate. Okay, so in atrial and ventricular flutter, you have more than one portion of the muscle being activated. And it can be caused by uh, defects in both the conducting and the contractile cardiomyocyte. And uh, the pathology is very broad. Yeah. But uh, the wave of excitation feedback feedbacks into itself. That's always the key here. And a re there's a re-excitation of the same muscle. And so coordination becomes uncoordinated. Sorry, contraction becomes uncoordinated. And no blood or negligible, negligible amounts of it is pumped by the heart. So finally, we get to see an actual ECG graph. This is a normal one, as you can see. If you look at lead two, I know it's hard to tell, but this is lead two. This is the normal one. The when you look at an average PQ, RSD, P, Q, R. Can't see S very well, but it's there, and T. So this is the normal one. And the heart rate here, you can count by boxes, but we don't know how many of these boxes is this system image I found online. But this R to R interval, this will be the heart rate. This is the heart rate. This is how you measure the heart rate with the R to R interval. So if there's tachycardia, there's going to be an increased heart rate. And so the R to R interval is going to be much lower. So they're not going to be as spaced out. So as you can see here, they're much closer together. There's only two boxes in between. Whereas here, there's like four boxes in between. Obviously, I don't know how much each box is, but physiologically, it's around 60 to 70 beats per minute. So that's tachycardia, increased heart rate. Bradycardia, obviously, so the R to R interval is going to be much bigger. So there's a decreased heart rate. Sorry, decreased heart rate. So the... R to R intervals, R intervals are going to be much bigger between each R wave. So that's quite simple. And again, this, this one is just lead two. This is just lead two of the ECG diagram. They've, obviously, each one differs. Even in the normal ones, you can see each one differs. And this might look like a ST elevation, but it's quite normal on these kind of uh, leads. So this is premature ventricular contraction. As you can see here, this is a normal PQRST wave, whereas here we have a premature ventricular contraction occurring. So normal uh, P, Q, R, S, T. Sorry, P, P, Q, R, S, and T, and then and then no P wave again. There's a premature ventricular contraction. There's another type of arrhythmia. And I think it's very important to distinguish between atrial flutter and atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is usually much, much faster and probably much worse. And an atrial flutter, you can easily tell on an ECG because it looks like a, it has a sawtooth pattern. So you can always distinct, distinguish it from other things. So obviously, there's increased re-excitation of the atrial cardiomyocyte, and there's a sawtooth pattern, whereas an atrial fibrillation is a lot more random and irregular. And we have four different types of ventricular arrhythmias here. On graph A, we have monomorphic, which means they all look the same, which is true because they all look the same, ventricular tachycardia. So ventricular tachycardia. And B, ventricular flutter, just uh, absolute mayhem here. As you can see, ventricular flutter. Uh, polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, which is the fact that there's different there's different morphologies, so the different sizes, and this is called this is also called torsades de pointes, which directly translates to twisting of the points, so twisting of the points. Uh, and then of course the last one is ventricular fibrillation, again like ventricular flutter but completely random and very. This is probably the most dangerous 
if you see this on a patient's ECG, this is probably the most dangerous thing that you can find, ventricular fibrillation. And that means there's completely uncoordinated uh, contraction going on and no to little amount of blood is being expelled by the heart. So it's completely rendered useless. And these are kind of different heart blocks that you can have. Like I previously mentioned, a heart block uh, here, prolonged PR interval over two se 0 0.2 se uh, seconds, so 200 milliseconds. Uh, and you have different degrees of the heart block because if an SA node depolarizes and some of, some of the what, uh, wave of depolarization is able to reach the atrioventricular node, you have a first degree AV block. And then if there's less and less being received by the atrioventricular uh, node, then the degree increases. And I don't know about Mobitz, but we call it Wankenbach syndrome for second degree AV, AV blocks. So as you can see here in first degree, you have PQRST and PQRST, but you can see there's a prolonged PR to me, prolonged PR to me. And of course, the segment includes the, the P wave, so it's included. Here. Sorry, the interval includes the P wave. Here. Second degree, and okay, so Wenkenbach phenomenon is occurs when there's normal, there's uh, AV block going occurring, but eventually there's a disappearing of the QRS complex. So as, you, as we have it, PQRST, P, and then there's no QRS complex because the PR, the, the PQ interval keeps, post, keeps lagging and lagging and lagging to the point where it just completely masks the QRS complex. So secondary degree, we've got again, Mobus 2 is just a worse phenomenon. Still a bit worse version. Two, two to one ratio here. That means two atrial contractions per every atrial contraction. Sorry, ventricular contraction. All right, last question of the day. Uh, choose the correct option. The sympathetic nervous system uses muscarinic receptors with a G stimulatory protein to increase cyclic AMP. Or B, the third heart sound is always pathological. C, the second heart sound occurs during the T wave of the ECG. Or D, the way in which the heart rate is changed is called ionotropism. Anyone else? Just one answer so far. All right, cool. So yes, the correct answer is C. The second heart sound does indeed occur during the T wave of the ECG. I had this in my final. They asked me in my oral. Um, the sympathetic nervous system does not use muscarinic receptors. They use adrenergic receptors. Muscarinic receptors are only for uh, in an uh, cholinergic synapse where acetylcholine is involved and acetylcholine which you always remember is for preganglionic and postganglionic fibers of the parasympathetic nervous system uh, but it, yeah this is this part is true G stimulatory protein increased cyclic AMP the third heart sound is always pathological that's not true sometimes it's physiological in young people and it can be heard in a microphone as well so it's not always pathological uh, the way in which the heart is changed is called ionotropism. This is incorrect. Ionotropism is to do with the contractility um, of, and the level of intracellular calcium ions within the cell, whereas uh, 
changing of heart rate is called chromotropism. And that about wraps up uh, the lecture on cardiac electrophysiology. I hope it was useful. Um, I hope everyone's staying mentally and physically healthy during quarantine and hope everyone has an extended good extended holiday this weekend even though many of us can't celebrate anyway so if you have any questions now would be a good time to ask and please uh, use the feedback link in the feedback form which you can found in the Facebook event discussion and give me a feedback if you found it useful and yeah thank you for your attention I'll be taking any questions if needed and if you do decide to ask any questions later, you can either contact me or any of the people at MIMSA. Uh, uh, yes, you will have access to this presentation. I will post it some somewhere. If you, if you need it, you can always private message me. And can you explain? All right, so. All right, so sinus respiratory arrhythmias. Uh, why is the heart rate faster during inspiration and slower during expiration? Okay, so let's let's take it from the start. You're inspiring. Air is going inside the body, and the intrathoracic pressure decreases, but the intra the cavity itself is getting larger. The pressure inside it is getting the volume increases, but the pressure decreases, obviously. And then there, therefore, there's a deep, there's a, there's a lower blood pressure because the vessels aren't being impeded as much, you know. So there's a lower blood pressure, and so this activates the baroreceptors. The baroreceptors are part of the baroreflex, which is a negative feedback reflex. So if there's a lower blood pressure, uh, like here, the baroreflex, uh, baroreceptors were going to cause there to be a lower vagal tone decreases the vagal, vagal, suppression of the vagal tone causes an, in, causing an increase of the heart rate and this occurs in the respiratory center and the cardiomotor center the medallion is to do with homeostasis i hope that explains it a lot more again if you have questions feel free to ask And yeah, and yeah, you will have access to the PowerPoint uh, somewhere. Definitely, I can definitely send it on. Okay, cool. Thank you.